Oh, yes. Ah, uh, okay. This thing's gone again. Okay. Just for this camera to reset, I will log out and log back in very much. Actually, you're on mute. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so yeah, Philippians chapter 3, uh, verse 12 to 14, if we could have someone read out. Philippians 3, 12 to 14. Yeah. Philippians 3, 12 to 14. Uh, note... As though I had already attained, either we are already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Amen. Uh, yes. Uh, so he says over here, uh, you know, this knowing and understanding the resurrection power of Christ, uh, participating in his sufferings, uh, all of this. He says, I have not already obtained all this. I would have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. So he says, it's true that I'm still in the process. I'm still uh, learning to know Christ. I'm still learning to participate in his uh, sufferings. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the resurrection power of God is still at work in me. I'm still in the process of becoming Christ-like. I have not yet arrived. So he accepts all this. But he says, you know, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. And he says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. So he says, you know, all these... Uh, past badges of honor that I had, you know, forgetting what is behind, forgetting what I thought, you know, I, I I thought that all of those things would, would bring me gain. And now I realize that they are nothing but loss. So, you know, I, I have put all that behind me. So forgetting what is behind, I'm still straining toward what is ahead. And uh, so then he goes on to say in verse 14, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. Uh, and uh, so uh, he is saying, you know, whatever is past is past. Leave it behind, but don't give up. You know, strain forward, press forward uh, to reach the heavenly goal that uh, Christ has for each of us. And uh, so he says in verse 17, you know, he says, um, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. So he says, in the same way that I am straining forward, in the same way I am pressing on to achieve, uh, you know, th these things that Christ wants to achieve in me. So in in the same way that I am cooperating with Him and submitting Him uh, uh, to Him and allowing uh, my life to be hidden in Him. So in this, in all of these things, he says, you know, imitate me, imitate my example, follow my example, he says. Um, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So he says, all those who are following this, uh, this method of living, uh, where they are uh, participating in Christ's sufferings, getting to know him, allowing his part to work in their lives, follow the example of such people. And then he goes on to say in verses 20 and 21, he says, why are we doing all of this? Why am I asking you to follow my example and the example of people who are living in this way? Why? Because we, are, we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him, it says what will happen? He will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his 
glorious body so that is what we are aiming at you know that is the goal that we are trying to reach so it's worth it you know it's worth it to um, to you know, to have to put up with opposition uh, you know from judaizers and and to uh, undergo all kinds of inconveniences to choose to be genuinely circumcised rather than you know being mutilators of the flesh so we choose to, uh, to you know follow this path why because we are awaiting that final um, goal where jesus in whom we have placed our faith he will come and he will transform our lowly bodies into uh, something similar to his glorious body so those are the things that he talks about here in um, philippians chapter 3 so moving into chapter 4 uh, which starts off with that passage about uh, Yodhya and Syntyche. Uh, so uh, if maybe if we could have someone read out verses 1, one 2 and 3. Yeah. Uh -huh. Philippians Therefore, chapter 4, 1 to 3. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, brethren, sorry, my joy and crown so stand fast in the Lord beloved. I implore Yodai and I implore Sintaich to be the, of the same mind in the Lord. I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Okay, so uh, having talked about uh, you know, um, participating in Christ's sufferings, having talked about how one day we, you know, we, we are awaiting this final um, uh, reward where we will be transformed uh, and have a resurrection body like Jesus. So having talked about all of these things, he says, because of this, because, you know, we are looking ahead to these kind of beautiful things, let us stand firm in the Lord in this way. So, you know, uh, in that context, he's basically saying to these two women leaders, he's saying, uh, what we are looking ahead for is something so valuable. So don't let us get derailed by, you know, disagreements, by conflicts and all of that. You know, uh, let us choose to have, um, you know, a same mind, uh, to be united in our minds regarding different matters. Uh, why? Because we are all, you know, working towards something very glorious. And he goes on to, in fact, point out in verse 3, he says, whose names are in the book of life. So he says, you know, th that is where our names are written down. And this is the hope that we are looking ahead to. Therefore, you know, let us not get derailed by all these uh, minor things. You know, and uh, we looked in uh, detail last uh, last session uh, into uh, what exactly was involved, you know, in this conflict and uh, 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 how these two ladies were being asked to be of the same mind because it would be a matter that would involve the congregation and so it would be very important to make sure that the congregation doesn't get divide doesn't get divided uh, so uh, you know all of these matters you know they would have to keep in their minds uh, even as they are you know um, even as they are striving ahead towards this eternal goal that you know god has for them so continuing in that context uh, he says in verses verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. So uh, over here, he's not just asking us to, you know, indulge in positive thinking. You know, when, when, when things are going bad, uh, you look for the silver lining in the cloud. No, he's not just asking you to do positive thinking over here. He says, the reason I'm asking you to rejoice uh, is because you're going to be doing it in the Lord. In the Lord, there is always hope. In the Lord, uh, there is always a solution. You know, even when things look impossible, there is still hope in the Lord. And we have, you know, Romans 8, 28 to 30, which talks about that. Um, if someone could actually read out Romans 8, 28 to 30. Romans 8, 28 to 30. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, 
to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, this he also called, whom he called, this he also justified, and whom he justified, he also glorified. So you see, it's because of uh, things like this that we are being asked to rejoice in the Lord. Um, so uh, yes, there was strife going on between these two persons. And because of that, it probably had generated friction in the entire church, which is why you know Paul is now uh, publicly addressing this entire issue in his letter. So um, something bad had happened out there. Uh, and uh, so he says, in spite of what is going on, rejoice. Why? Because you are in the Lord. And uh, what does God do? You know, what does God do for us? He works for the good of those who love him in all things. So even in this, you know, if you turn to the Lord, if you trust in him, he will work it all out for good. And why? Why would God do that? Because uh, he has, you know, predestined us. He has already written down our names in the book of life. So we have been predestined. To be confirmed to the image of his son so let us you know have the same mind as christ let us uh, you know uh, conduct ourselves and and deal with the situation the way christ would and so he 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 uh, you know here in, in romans he talks about how those who have been called have been justified and how one day they will be glorified so because of all of these things that we have uh, you know to look forward to uh, he he is probably advising Yodhya and Sintak to continue rejoicing in the Lord. And then he says something important in verse 5. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Okay, so um, what exactly is this connection between you know, being gentle and the Lord being near? Uh, we see that very, very clearly explained in James chapter 5, verses 7 to 11. Okay, where we can see a clear connection between the need to remain gentle, uh, you know, especially in a conflict situation, and the fact that the Lord is near. Uh, so, if, if we could uh, read James chapter five, verses seven to eleven, just James, to kind of get gain clarity. James five seven to eleven. James five seven to eleven, and he reads, "Therefore, be patient, but brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits." for precious fruits of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. All the way to nine, ma'am? Yes, yeah. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned behold the judge is standing at the door behold the judge is standing at the door yes yeah so we see over here you know we kind of get kind of now understand what uh you know paul is probably saying uh because james also seemed to have uh seemed to have touched upon the same thing let your gentleness be evident to all because the lord is near you see his 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 coming is going to be very very soon and uh so when he comes uh, you know, you're going to be receiving your reward. So in the same way, the farmer patiently waits uh, for, you know, for, for the crop because uh, he knows it's going to be coming soon. In the same way, because the Lord's coming is also very near, be patient and stand firm is, is what he says in uh, James says in James 5, 8. And he says, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. He's near. He's very, very close. Uh, so even though these two women leaders are having strife between them, it would be good for them to uh, to come to an agreement, to come to the same mind regarding whatever it is that you know they were arguing about. Uh, why? Because uh, the Lord is near, and it's good for them to remain gentle, uh, to remain, um, you know, to, to continue having a godly attitude in this matter because when Christ comes, there's going to be a great reward. So it is worth it. So it is worth it, uh, uh, you know, to, to continue with an attitude of rejoicing, you know, rather than uh, growing bitter and, uh, 
um, uh, allowing all kinds of negative things to creep into their hearts you know they are being urged uh, to may continue maintaining the right attitude and uh, then he you know uh, goes on to talk about uh, how, what kind of a uh, attitude we need to have uh, in verse 6 where he says not be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to god i mean um, this is a wonderful verse uh, it's been a great comfort to me and to a lot of people because over here he's not just talking about uh, you know the conflict situation that was going on in the church he says regarding any matter you don't need to be anxious Okay, not just about this one particular thing where there's some conflict going on between two leaders of the church. No, not just regarding that one little matter. Regarding anything, it's so beautiful. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. You know, so uh, whatever your situation may be, it may have nothing to do regarding conflict in the church or leadership or anything. It may just be something that you are going through at a personal level in your own personal life. So regarding anything you don't need to be anxious because in every situation you can come to the lord and how would you come to the lord you would come to him with prayer and petition there are two words being used over here uh, the first is uh, you know you you go to him with prayer that uh, is the most common word in the greek word that is used over there um, that would be prosush uh, p r o s e u C H E, um, you know that's that's the word used over there, and that's the word that is used in the New Testament thirty six times to talk about, you know, uh, praying about communicating with God. So it refers to just about every kind of communication. You know, uh, it may be thanksgiving, it may be a petition, it may be, um, uh, you know, uh, intercession, whatever different forms of prayer. It's just a common general word. Um, which talks about communicating with God. So he says, you know, rather than being anxious, uh, you know, don't be anxious about anything, whatever the situation may be, may be, in every situation that you're facing, you can come to him with prayer, uh, with, with, with this word prosush, where you, where you can have this privilege of communicating directly with Almighty God. You know, you're not just going to some leaders and hoping that they will do something for you. Uh, you're not going to any, uh, you know, earthly person and, uh, you know, uh, seeking their help. No, you can directly bypass all of them, go directly to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and have communication with him. I mean, it's like such a great honor. So he says, uh, you know, in every situation, go to him, go to him with prayer. And then the other word that is used over there is, um, you know, it's translated in English as petition in NIV uh, and other words are used. Uh, now, this would be the Greek word uh, DSS. Uh, now, this is word which is used, uh, I think it is used 18 times, yeah, 18 times in the New Testament. And it refers to um, prayers uh, that have greater urgency because some, some, more serious matter is at hand and so the person is you know pressing forward in prayer uh they're, they're praying with urgency uh, they need a solution soon uh, they need help you know uh, in this thing that they are uh, facing so um this word is a stronger word um, and uh, one example that we can take uh, could be james chapter 5 verse 16 where you have actually two different words for prayer mentioned um but yeah if someone could 16 therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed the prayer of righteous person has great power as it was worked yeah so uh here the first time when he says pray james you know when he's writing and he, he says therefore confess your sins to each other and pray the word used over there is yukomai that's you know one word for another word for prayer then in the sec next sentence where it says the prayer of a righteous man is powerful over there that word is used the word that is used over there is deasis you know this is the word where you're praying with urgency and it says over there 
the the dss you know the urgent prayer of a righteous person is very powerful very effective so uh, that's the kind of assurance that we have so here you know paul when he is writing uh, his letter uh, to the philippians he says don't be anxious about anything whatever your situation may be go to the lord communicate with him and you know uh, come to him with dss you know with this urgent prayers where where you urgently need his help why you know we, like james says uh, it is all right to do that because uh, your prayer that kind of a dss urgent prayer can be very powerful and effective when it is being done by a believer a righteous person uh, so um, he, he urges the people in philippians uh, you know in the philippian church to come to god with this kind of prayer and this kind of fervent urgent petition and then he says with thanksgiving so when you come to the lord with this kind of prayer um, it is all right to come with thanksgiving in advance because god will you know answer you he will help you now um, uh, as we all know god does not always grant us exactly what we want but we can be assured that whatever he gives us it will be uh, it, it, it has been given most thoughtfully only with our good in mind so um, sometimes the prayer that you know, we uh, pray may not be answered in exactly the way that we would like it to be answered but we can have the assurance that god will you know do his best for us uh, because of his great faithfulness and therefore it says when you come to him with prayer and petition come to him come to him with thanksgiving with an attitude of thanks where you know where you truly know that he will answer he will resolve your your issue in the best way possible so you can have that assurance and therefore in advance you can already say thank you lord thank you that you're going to be doing this you know in in, in a way that will uh, bring me the great, greatest benefit so we can have that deep assurance just one verse you know which is very helpful um, in 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 being able to come with this attitude of thanksgiving um, uh, a verse which kind of helps us you know in in that regard uh, jeremiah 17 verses 7 and 8 if someone could read out uh, jeremiah 17 verses 7 and 8 Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Yeah, I, you can just go ahead. Yeah, if you can read. Yeah. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by the water that sends out its root by the stream and does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Okay, so this is the assurance that we can have in the Lord. You know, there will be times of heat when the heat is intense, uh, when we are going through some tough challenges. Uh, so in those situations, we do not need to be anxious or worried why because uh, your leaves it says will stay green you know when it is when it's all over when god has brought you through it all your leaves will still be green you won't be all you know shriveled up and uh, you know with all the energy sucked out of you and you know you won't be just left in one corner in one uh, in one defeated miserable condition no he will bring you through that terrible season of heat why because he is, it says, blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. So if you are trusting in the Lord, if you are coming to him with your prayers and petitions and simple faith, you are blessed. So you are one person whose leaves will stay green even through that terrible time of heat. And then it goes on to say, uh, this kind of a tree, it has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. So even you know when you're going through a time of intense drought in your life, 
where uh, the answers don't seem to be coming through, where the provision that you require has not made its appearance, and things seem to be really bad, and it looks like you are headed towards destruction. It looks like as if you're headed towards uh, you know, total loss. But even uh, in such situations, you can have the deep assurance that you will bear fruit uh, because you know you have chosen to trust in the Lord. Therefore, you are blessed. You are blessed. God will bless you. God will take care of you. Uh, so because of that, uh, because of scriptures like this, you know, we can uh, uh, we can follow what uh, Paul is saying over here. He says, you know, do not be anxious about anything in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, with a deep assurance that God will answer, that he will take care. He may not grant you what you want, but he will answer in the best way possible. So having that assurance, present your requests to God is what uh, Paul says in verse 6. And... Um, then if we can uh, move on to verse 7, which is connected to what we just talked about. It's verse 7, please. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Yeah, so you see, when we choose to have that kind of an attitude, when we say, Lord, I am filled with anxiety regarding the situation, but I choose, I make a conscious choice not to stay anxious. Rather, I choose to come to you with my prayer and petition with thanksgiving, you know, thanking you in advance because I know what kind of a God you are. I know you're faithful. So, you know, we, we have this whole attitude of coming to him in trust. If we are having that kind of an attitude, such people, he guards their hearts and minds he personally guards their hearts and minds through his peace. Okay, the peace of God, it says, will guard your hearts and minds. Uh, now, the, the term that is used over here, that word guarding, um, that's, uh, that's a word which, they, which was very common in those days. It was a military term that was used. It referred specifically to a, uh, to a unit of guards you know, who would literally be guarding uh, the city gates. So nothing goes in, nothing goes out of the city gates. Without the know, without the knowing of the of these guards, they they see to it that uh, only um, authorized things are permitted inside the city, you know, and and they make sure that uh, you know nobody just escapes from the city uh, who is not supposed to. So they guard the city in that sense. Um, and now the city of Philippi, you know, the way the believers were living, that actually had this kind of a guard. There was this Roman garrison. Which was, uh, you know, planted at all the gates, all the entry points to the city. So um, everything was always guarded. Now, uh, so they would have understood, you know, when Paul uses this particular term, they would have quick, immediately caught the um, the significance of what is being said. So um, uh, Paul says, if you have an attitude of trust, rather than being anxious, if you choose to have this attitude of trust, uh, then the peace of God will be like this garrison you know this, this this unit of soldiers uh, so the peace of god will be like this unit of soldiers uh, and they god the god's peace will literally stand guard at your at the door of your heart at the door of your mind um, you know so that uh, rather than being completely um, upturned and you know kind of churned out in your feelings in your emotions you will experience peace and I'm very sure that all of us have, you know, experienced that uh, at least, you know, once or twice. Uh, because um, there have been occasions where I know I should have been highly anxious, uh, but you know, because I mean those were big things for me personally. So, uh, but uh, in those situations, God knew that I would not be able to bear it on my own, and it's like a peace, a, a, a peace which I cannot understand which just kind of took over it says so here you know peace of god which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your mind so the beautiful thing is it says you will be your your you know you, your emotions your feelings will be guarded and your thinking will be guarded in both of these things both your thoughts and your feelings god will guard over you with 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 peace so that you will not be attacked uh, by all these uh, uncontrollable 
negative thoughts and you know uh, very destructive feelings and emotions so this is something that god will do for us it's not something that we can you know cook up on our own from our side what what do we, what should we do we make a conscious effort and say lord because you have said so in your word i choose not to continue being anxious about this particular issue but rather i will come to you and i will place my petition before you with thanksgiving knowing that you will answer so i'll do this this is my part i will do my part lord if with your help and then you o oh lord guard my heart my feelings and guard my thinking with the peace of god you do that o oh lord for me and so you know the lord actually does that uh, for us um so that is why you know we we, we colossians 3 2 to 3 which we looked at earlier it says set your mind on things above not on earthly things for you died and your life is now hidden with christ in god so in in these times of trial we can have this deep assurance that our life is hidden in christ nothing can ever be done to us that is not permitted by the lord so we can have this assurance that he is guarding over us he is watching over us and so uh, rather than allowing ourselves to be anxious and think a whole bunch of negative thoughts we choose to set our mind on things above because we are hidden in christ you know so we we can choose to do that uh, so uh, for me uh, personally uh, one way that i have been able to you know um, uh, understand um, this you know the scripture about bringing our prayers and petitions to the lord um, when i picture myself as daily coming to him with my heavy burdens you know bringing dragging along those large huge sacks of worries and you know placing them at his feet and doing it again all over again tomorrow and then having to go through that whole process again the day after that i uh, just the very thought of it just makes me feel so tired and then uh, one day you know it just kind of occurred to me uh, it's not like you're coming to jesus every day and bringing those heavy weights you know dragging them and putting them at his feet no you are in him you are abiding in him your life is in him so you're already there you don't have to come to him and you know place it at his feet like as if you know you, you know it's it's your the, sh- the burden is on your shoulders and you have to somehow shoulder it and endure it and bear it and bring it to him daily and remind him of it no you are in him your life is in him you know so you can rejoice in the lord because you are in the lord you can rejoice in the lord you can wait upon him and he is already aware of what you are going through so now all you need to do when you come in prayer is you know rather than saying lord i have dragged it all the way here and now i'm bringing it to you no you're already in him he is already aware of what you're going through so you just talk it through with him lord this thing has come upon me and you are aware of it i am abiding in you how lord how do i handle this i need your strength oh lord i need you to guard my heart and mind so that i don't Uh, I don't. I said I'm not overwhelmed by this thing. Show me what to do, oh Lord. Uh, show me how to approach this. Give me scriptures that I can just stand upon, so that they can guard me. You know, guard my heart. So I realize that it's much easier for me to think of myself as already abiding in Him, where. he is already aware of what is going on and he is already you know working you know uh, on those situations so it's not like as if i am you know say, living independently separately somewhere and every day i have to drag all that stuff and put it in front of him i'm already in him and he's already he already knows now all i need to do is discuss it you know talk it out with him uh, so uh, that way of looking at it kind of you know helps me um let's you know move on very quickly uh, to maybe oh yeah maybe we could read verses 8 and 9 because these two are connected with you know the god of peace and the peace of god which guards uh, so verses 8 and 9 if someone could read out finally Thank brethren, brethren. Finally. whatever things are true whatever things are noble whatever things are just whatever things are pure whatever things are lovely whatever things are of good report if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy meditate on these things the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me these do and the god of peace will be with you 
you know, if you could just give me a few seconds, this um, battery seems to be going out. If you could just give me a few seconds, I'll. Okay, yeah, very sorry. Looks like this laptop is getting a bit old. Um, yeah. Oh, so, um, yeah. So he says, Paul says, uh, you know, let your mind dwell upon these things because when you do that, then the God of peace will be with you. So um, the our part, the role that we play is to keep our minds on what is true. You know, that's placed first in the list. There are many things which I mentioned, you know, noble things and right things and pure things and lovely things and all of that. But the very first thing that is mentioned is whatever is true. Because usually the battle in the mind is regarding the truth. You know, Satan says, oh, it's not going to work. Oh, you know, God is not going to come through. Um, you know, uh, oh, uh, the, the, what, how God is telling you to deal with the situation is, is not really very effective. So there's a lot of stuff that is, uh, a lot of attacks that come against the truth of God's word. So if we can just keep our minds focused on the truth of God's word and choose to believe what God's word is saying, even when all circumstances are pointing in the opposite direction and it looks like as if, you know, um, uh, your, your life is going to be destroyed. You know, even when things look like that, even when things look that bleak, you choose to just stand on the truth of God's word and say, I'll keep my mind on the truth of what scripture is saying rather than on what circumstances seem to be saying. You know, when we take that stand, the God of peace in whom we are trusting, he will be with us. He will guard our hearts, our emotions, our feelings, and you know, and keep them from becoming overwhelmed. He will guard our thinking and enable us, help us to you know dwell on those positive things which are from Him, rather than uh, you know dwelling on upon uh, upon all these destructive scenarios which which you know Satan um, throws at us. You know, saying things will go in this way, things will go in that way. No, things will not go in any of those ways because um, God is for us, and if God is for us who or what can ever be against us you know so we we choose to uh, place our minds on what is true and what is pure and noble and uh, so he says not only do we think those things even in our actions uh, we choose we choose to put into practice you know the kind of things that paul has been practicing uh, so so that um, uh, in all of this the god of peace will be with us and he will you know guard us and help us um, so then he, uh, after this, he kind of moves on into the next topic um, uh, where he's now talking about the help which he has received from the uh, Philippians. So um, if we could have someone just read out verse 10. Yeah. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Yeah, he says, um, at last you renewed your concern for me. So which means for a certain period of time, they had not shown concern towards him. I mean, uh, he, he, and then he clarifies and says, indeed, you were concerned throughout, uh, but you had no opportunity to show it uh, simply because, you know, they were sitting in the city of Philippi. He, on the other hand, uh, was all over the place, you know, ministering in so many different places. And now, of course, right now, when he's writing this letter, he's in Rome during his first imprisonment. So they were concerned for him all along, but they didn't have um, an opportunity to show it. Uh, and uh, so what do they do? They finally decide that we can't just leave it like this. You know, we need to be there for Paul. I mean, we are partnering with him, you know, in the gospel. So we can't just leave him like that. And so they actually take a decision and send off one of their leaders to go and be there with him 
and serve him and help him, which is how Epaphrodi uh, Epaphroditus, you know, ends up in Rome. So he is sent over there to Rome, and it, ex uh, you know, these things we get to know in Philippians chapter two, uh, verse twenty-five, where it says that Epaphroditus was sent to these people. Um, uh, whom you sent to take care of my needs is what he says in Philippians 2.25. So the Philippians believers could not personally come to Paul, but at least they sent this man so that he would take care of Paul's needs. And the same thing he again says in uh, Philippians 2.30. He says that this man, after coming over there, he risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. So they were very concerned for him and they were not willing to just sit back because, you know, uh, circumstances did not allow them to personally do anything for him. So they didn't just sit back and say, OK, fine, you know, we have no responsibility. I mean, we are very far away. Uh, there are, you know, um, a lot of kilometers separating us from Paul. So we are under no obligation to do anything. No, they still had the desire inside them to do something for this man of God. And so they finally actually send one of their own. Uh, to serve him, to look after him. And so he really appreciates this concern that they have for him. And that is why you know, he, he's, he goes on to say the words that he speaks in verses 11 to 13. Uh, if someone could read out verses 11 to 13, please. And really, thank you so much that you know so many of you are you know coming forward to read. Uh, that's just so encouraging. So thank you so much. Yeah, verses 11 to 13. Not that I'm speaking, speaking of being in. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to be abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah, you know, um, uh, he goes on to say something more, uh, which, you know, we'll touch upon later. Uh, but yeah, uh, right now, you know, let's just focus on this particular passage, you know. Uh, uh, so he says over here, um, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. So he says, yes, there was a need. And I'm very, very glad that you have fulfilled it, uh, you know, met that need. Uh, but I would have continued to be content even if that need had not been met. So he's kind of sharing this with them because there's a very important truth that he's trying to convey over here. Uh, so he says, you know, the secret of this, uh, uh, he says in verse 12, he says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. And what is the secret? The, uh, the secret is found in verse 13, where he says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. So uh, why is Paul able to? stay content in even the most adverse circumstances because Christ gives him the strength to do it. This man has uh, you know, decided a long time ago, I no longer live. Christ is, is living in me. So if Christ wants to bring hardships you know, and put me through a time of suffering, fine, I will participate in the sufferings in this way. Um, so um, if God puts me through a time of hunger, you know, where my needs are not being met, all right. My life is in Christ. I'm hidden in him. So Christ is taking me through this particular phase for something. So, you know, I just go through it, keeping my eyes focused on him because he says, right, I live this life by faith in the son of God. So, you know, he's, 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 he actually practices all these scriptures which he talks about. And so uh, because he's living like this, you know, he has discovered that when there is a time of need, when he requires the strength, Christ gives him the strength which he needs. And so on his own, he would never have been content. It would have been impossible. He's able to be content only because Christ is giving him that strength. Christ is guarding his heart and mind and keeping it at peace, keeping it contented, even when things are you know, um, uh, rather difficult. And uh, so he says, I can do all this through him 
who gives me the strength you know going back to ephesians chapter 6 verse 10 you know um, uh, over there he says uh, when, he's, when he's just before he starts talking about the armor of god something that he says over there he says finally be strong in the lord and in his mighty power so how does a person uh, stay strong they stay strong when they are in the lord and they and they stay strong in his mighty power you know uh, it's, it's that resurrection power which he talks about um, in in the earlier chapter in ephesians that is what he's referring to so it is possible to be strong to be content in all situations how through the resurrection power of god this is not something that can be humanly done so from his side i suppose every time a challenge would come along paul would make a conscious choice not to be anxious but to come to god with his prayer and petition with thanksgiving so he would just do his part and because he has maintained that attitude of trust jesus christ would do his part by imparting divine strength to this man to be content his heart and mind would stay at peace because the god of peace would literally guard him and from his side paul would just continue to you know keep his mind on what is true what is noble what is pure rather than you know dwelling upon all these negative scenarios which satan is you know bringing into his mind he chooses rather to dwell upon the things of god and even as he does that the god of peace is with him so it's all you know it kind of ties together um, so what he is saying you know makes sense when we when we understand all of this now um, you know we are kind of running out of time so just very quickly to uh, to to run through some things um, later on you know after paul had finished writing this letter to the philippians uh, this is something this this incident has not yet happened you know when paul is still writing this particular philippian letter i'm talking about second timothy chapter 4 verses 16 to 17 so second timothy 4 16 to 17 you know we know that was his last letter because sometime after that you know he gets martyred and uh, so he's in the final stages of his life and uh, he is supposed to have had his first defense at which time everyone deserts him because by now you know people can uh, begin to see that this is not heading anywhere this man is going to be killed so if you're not in touch with the man who's going to get killed chances are that you will also not get killed so you know that everyone kind of you know pulls back nobody wants to show support to him because you know who knows if they if they if they are support to him in his uh, supportive towards him in his last days you know they too may be thrown to the lions uh, so in that stage of life you know where everyone has abandoned him this is what he goes on to say in second timothy chapter 4 verse 17 but the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength. I mean, amazing. You know, it's like Jesus Christ was literally standing there next to him, giving him the strength that he needed to go through that situation. So that is the confidence that we too can have, that in our time of trial and difficulty, if we choose not to be anxious, but instead to trust him, Jesus Christ will literally stand there next to us and give us the strength which we need you know, to go through those particular situations. And um, you know, like we have literally two minutes left, but I really want to just you know, um, emphasize this. He says in verse 17, you know, kind of repeating the same thought which he had mentioned earlier. He says, not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is, the, is that more be credited to your account. So he says, I'm really happy, you know, with the way you have, you know, lavishly sent me gifts uh, with through Ep Epaphroditus. And I'm really grateful for all that you have done for me. Uh, but not that I desire your gifts. So you see, I really like this attitude of Paul. He's not desperately clutching on to these Philippians because they are the one party who are like, you know, sh kind of showing him kindness and showing him mercy. He, he, because the tendency of believers who are in deep need, especially if they're in deep financial need, they just clutch on to any person who kind of shows a little bit of kindness. And, they, and they're so desperate. And they keep asking you again and again, you know, to, to give them money, to help them. And you can only do so much, right? Because there are so many people in need. And you try to do whatever you can for a whole bunch of people. And you're not God. And you don't have unlimited finances. And the thing is that these people are so desperately clutching on to you, you know, and like as if you're you're the one hope. And so finally, when you when you when you when you reach a point where you say, No, I cannot help, they get really angry. They say, What kind of a person are you? What kind of a Christian are you? And they get really angry with you. 
Paul, when you look at him over here, you know, two times he emphasizes that. First, you know, he says, I am not saying this because I am in need. You know, he says that in verse 11. And again, here in verse uh, 17, he says, not that I desire your gifts. What's actually making me happy is not uh, the gift, though I'm very, very grateful for that. I'm just so happy that now God is going to give you a great reward because of what you have done for me. And that fills me with joy. Here is a man who's not desperate. Here is a man who is so secure in his identity of being hidden in Christ. He knows Christ will take care. So he's he's not desperately clinging on to people. He just clings on to his Lord, knowing that his Lord will take care. And that's the way uh, we people of God should be. Because when we desperately cling on to people, those people may not have the capacity to be God and, and to do everything for us that we are expecting of them. They're just people. Rather, let us be people like um, you know Paul, who are so secure in their identity in Christ, and they are so hidden, and their life is so hidden in Christ, that they just rest in him, trust him, and just relax in him. And he takes care of the details. Lovely attitude that this Paul had. You know, so that's just something that I wanted to point out. Um, and yeah, we've totally run out of time. Uh, so you know, we'll just close with a word of prayer, please. Lord, we just thank you so much for all the lessons that we could learn uh, today from Philippians 3 and 4. I pray, O oh Lord, that we will remember these things uh, long after and that we would continue to apply them, O oh Lord, in our lives. Lord, uh, we, we pray that, um, um, that we will not be anxious, but rather we will, uh, we will recognize that our lives are hidden in you. And we will be confident in you, O oh Lord. I pray that we will be people uh, who want to be found in you. And because we are so um, eager to be found in you, we are so eager to know you uh, that we are, oh Lord, help us to, be, to, to, to know, to, to want this to an extent where we are willing to even participate in your sufferings, even if it means. Um, allowing Christ to live in us, even, even if it means that we will have to suffer, that we will have to undergo hardships and trials, we will be willing to do that because by doing that, we will experience more and more of your resurrection power in our lives. And one day we will have our reward, O oh Lord, of being glorified in you. So we pray that we will keep our eyes on these eternal things and, um, and go through the uh, current situations that we are going through because we know that Christ is standing right next to us and you will give us the strength which we require to face all our situations. Thank you, O oh Lord, for the great faithfulness in your, for your great faithfulness in our lives. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you would be with the students uh, for the rest of the week, even as they um, attend to so many different things. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yes. Thank you so much. And yeah, we'll meet again next week.